It's too funny, really, if you think about it. You're not recording this, are you? No. I am now, though. Now I'm recording. So talk to me a little bit. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Pre-Accident Podcast. I'm Todd Conklin. How are you? What is it? It's the uh, 10th of August, I think. Yeah, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay, that's right. I got it said. So today's podcast is interesting for sure because we're going to talk to our old buddy, Martha Acosta, and she's going to talk about her uh, her new research she's doing uh, at George Washington University, the university that is called George Washington. And she's going to ask for some help, so she needs your help, and I'm going to appeal to you to actually make sure this help happens because, in fact... I think her research is about as interesting as can be. It certainly fits around kind of this whole notion of how we're seeing the world. It's really about, I'm not going to use the phrase just workplace because I don't think that's accurate, actually. We can talk, that should be a whole podcast probably. She's really studying carefully this notion of psychological safety and emotional um, uh, managers' abilities to sort of uh, manage things like trust, confidence, openness, those kind of things. And she's doing this study, and she's looking specifically at safety managers. So um, that's us. people. No, not safety managers. People who manage high-risk operations, which is almost anybody. Uh, they, it's all explained. I talked to Martha. It was great. We really had a fun conversation. Things are screaming along here. I have so many things to tell you guys. Um, I, I don't think I'm going to get it today because uh, I'm running a little tight on time on this podcast today. But I've got to tell you guys the story of the murder hotel because if I don't get that, I, I forgot to tell you, and it's a really good story. So remind me to tell you that story because it's um, it's worth listening to. I just got back from D.C., saw a bunch of people, Bill Hoyle and 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 uh, oh, a whole bunch of people at the uh, at at this big meeting in D.C. and that was really a good time. We had fun. It was really good connecting with everybody in the ORC gang. And now I'm just getting ready to hang out and do some stuff and, uh, you know, enjoy kind of the summer a little because I haven't really gotten the chance to have summer yet. So I'm going to squeeze it in because, you know, it is mid-August, so it's probably time. School's starting. The The week's been nuts. I mean, just just nuts. It's this this shooting stuff that's going on. It's just it's it's really kind of it's we need to talk about that as well. I, I don't know. If, if I'm ready to have that conversation, I've been thinking about this a lot, but it's, it's something we should think about and, and talk about because it's got me really concerned. The whole thing is really concerned. And I would look at that and think we're in our system. Are we allowing the conditions that are necessary for this to exist, to exist? And that's what we ought to talk about. So, so let's, let's make a pact to get back together and talk about that. But now my entire focus is going to be on, on really Martha and, and what she's doing. Do me a giant favor. Do this. It takes some time, but it's worth it. Um, and she can get the data. And I think it'll help us as a community. And so that's got some value as well. So I'll shut up. Let's go ahead and just jump into Martha. Here's here's uh, Martha and, uh, and myself. And we're going to chit and chat about a whole bunch of stuff, but mostly about her research. So sit back and relax and have fun. I'll, I'll talk to you on the other side. Okay, so we have to talk about your PhD project, your research project, which is is super interesting to me. So tell me what it is, what this, what's this project doing? What are you looking at? So what we're looking at is we're looking for a predictive relationship between emotional intelligence and cognitive complexity and response to paradox. And it all sounds sort of highfalutin and very intellectual at this point, but I want to explain how important it is in order to establish a certain kind of relationship that really helps us understand the role that um, emotional resiliency and um, cognitive resiliency give leaders in high hazard organizations. So what do you, when you say emotional resiliency or cognitive resiliency, what are you saying? I'm saying that in a emotionally difficult situation, 
Are we as leaders of high hazard operations able to deal with that situation in an emotionally um, equanimous, in an emotionally stable way so that we can make good decisions in the moment? If you would say the word bespoke, every technical term would be used in the same sentence. (laughs) Equanimous? So equanimity yeah, no, is I, the noun, and then I think that the adjective is equanimous. No, I'm with you, but it it means stable. I so, mean, yeah, so, so but me, no, but it's it's stable, and not in this. I, the reason why I like this word is that it's not sort of stable like the floor is stable. It's stable like a boat is stable. Um, it emotional equanimity is us being able to ride the waves of our emotions no matter how intense they are and still keep our heads above water so it's not about being uh you know calm in every situation it's about being appropriate in every situation okay that makes so and, and so let me build on why i think this is so important why i think the work you're doing is so important and i could be wrong so tell me if i'm wrong okay how leaders respond colors how organizations act absolutely and so what you're really talking about is what i spend all my time saying be better be more careful be a better leader don't be reactive be responsive you're actually saying there's an underpinning of science behind that yeah and we need to understand that a leader's response is really a product of a larger bigger set of uh, uh of characteristics maybe uh, Absolutely. right and so that's what you're studying oh see i think that's super sexy that's interesting Yeah. So underneath all of that, you can say, you know, be this way or be a better leader. And there's all of these behaviors, right? Um, that, that, that different consultants can tell you are the right behaviors for being a leader in this kind of a situation. Well, the thing is that those responses, that reaction, those behaviors come from those are driven by things that are happening in our unconscious, in our emotions, in our bodies, in our unconscious cognitive processes. And so what I'm looking at when I look at emotional intelligence as a measure and cognitive complexity as a measure is I'm looking at your cognitive emotional abilities that are beyond what just your deciding that you want to be that way. Uh, everybody knows that they have decided that they're going to do something and they don't do it. Or they decide that they're going to do something a certain way because that's the right decision, but they don't do it. Why don't we do that? Why is there such a huge knowing doing gap? And it's because our behavior is driven by unconscious processes more than conscious processes. There's this great um, study where uh, neuroscientists put people in fMRI machines and the task was simple. When you hear a beep, raise either your right or left hand and you get to decide whether you raise your right or your left hand. And so they observed what happened because in an fMRI machine, you're able to see blood flow and you're able to actually see the changes in the brain. So um, they, you know, they give these, the stimulus and people raise their right or their left hand and the scientists are viewing what's happening in the brain. Well, before, so our prefrontal cortex is the part of our brain up in the front that, um, that makes the decision. But our, our, um, cerebellum, um, back in the back is what's actually driving us to move our hand. And what they saw was that the cerebellum would activate and then the right or left hand would raise depending on which side of the cerebellum activated. And then only after that would our prefrontal cortex making the decision activate. So we think we're making conscious decisions, but in fact, our non-conscious mind is, has actually made a decision and started the action before we've made the decision. And, and Rasmussen would call, if I, if I can translate uh-huh. this, Rasmussen in the performance modes would call this skill-based. So emotions are skill-based. 
yeah. they're they're un, we're unconsciously competent. We're unconsciously the, the we it's it's automatic. Yeah, it's automatic. And I I, I want to go back to that in a second, but let me tell you the second part of the of the um of the experiment. So then what they did was they had the same, you know, I don't know if it was the same people, but they had people in same, they told them the same things. We're going to give you a beep and you're going to raise your right or left hand, whichever one you want, you get to decide. And, but this time they stimulated the cerebellum. And so the scientists decided, they decided we're going to have him raise his right hand or we're going to have her raise her left hand. And, but the same thing happened. The, the scientists stimulated the unconscious parts of the brain. The right or the left hands uh, raised, depending on what the scientists decided. And then the subject's prefrontal cortex activated. And those subjects believed that they decided to raise their right or their left hand these are not the, these are not the droids you search these are not the droids you look for <laughs> exactly <laughs> so so now 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 so what you're doing is you're going to look at this you're going to study this yeah you're actually going to put some some empirical work around this you're going to put some some science some some research under this right and you want to look specifically at safety leaders Yeah. So I'm looking specifically at, um, and we're titling them managers, but it has nothing to do with your, um, with your actual title of your job. It's, there's a whole list of managerial activities, um, that the literature has. And these are activities essentially where you have the power to influence the organizational systems. So we're looking for people who influence the organizational systems in organizations that have high hazard operations. Now you don't necessarily have to work in high hazard operations directly, but you have high hazard, but you have to, your organization has to be a high hazard organization like, um, aviation, transportation, uh, the military, Chem- chemical, oil chemical. And gas. Yeah. Oil I would and actually gas. suggest, cause my world has, has expanded high performance computing. So high hazard computing, right. banking, international banking, right. international finance, uh, cloud control, uh, all those things are super high hazard. The consequence of failure is untenable. Right. Is, is how we define is it. It's basically how and we so, define it. And so what do these people need to do? So because you need the help. Yeah. Because that's how research happens. Yeah. And because you've focused on, on people who have the ability to influence organizations that do high hazard work, which this is a really good podcast for. And I know actually, so it's no mystery why that's an interesting group to you. That's how we met is yes. this area. You need people to help become a part of that study. Yeah. But they don't have to. It's, it's not like they're going to be like it says Fred Jones. It's an anonymous part of that. It's study. totally anonymous. So, so if your company's freaked out about, I don't know, public, it's not like that at all. No, no, no. So, so, so I have no study site. Perfect. Everybody is, you know, as individuals joining completely anonymously. And so that's really important to my IRB, my institutional Absolutely. review board at, at George Washington, where Absolutely. I'm conducting the research. Um. And, and basically, you know, the biggest hazard, so I'm asking people to do three psychological tests and it has to be anonymous because the only hazard is that let's say you take the emotional intelligence test that I'm asking people to take and that, and, and I'm and that somehow your score can be tied to you and somebody finds out what your score is and somebody judges that score as not being sufficient right then then that's the biggest hazard to you is that your lack of anonymity could you know somebody could right. construe that in a certain way so it's really important that it's anonymous which most people ask me oh can i have my test scores and i'm like i i can't give yeah, them so to was, you because i can't know yeah. that they're yours so i was just going to tell you I, so i've taken the test which i want to talk to you about so don't let me forget that okay and i do not know what my results were nor did I want to, I might yeah. add. That didn't seem important to me. But the results, in fact, it's the kind of testing where you answer questions or in some cases you write some narrative, which I actually found really fun. And then you just go to the next test. So it's not like a big, there's not a big like ending of no. you have completed test one. It just <laughs> kind of moves you 
it, it's it's actually pretty elegant how it does this. I mean, that's pretty interesting. So, yeah. so I interrupted, but I, I yeah. wanted to get that in. Right. Well, I want to, can I geek out a little yeah, bit I on, think you have, on the So you test? haven't yet? I'm sorry. You <laughs> used the word equanimity. <laughs> yes, you may geek out. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I've told you the story about how when I was married to a physicist, somebody came up to somebody really, I'm not even going to say his name, but somebody who's super, super famous came, came up to me and said, you know, you're too good looking to be a physicist's wife. And I said, you know, I'm too good looking to have the IQ that I have. <laughs> Jerk. Anyway, um, <laughs> so, so I, um, so what I wanted to geek out on, on is like why all of these different pieces of this test are really important. So this whole idea of, um, organizational paradox is kind of a weird thing, but the reason why I'm using this as part of the design is really kind of cool and important. Organizational paradox is a socially constructed phenomenon. And think of the phenomenon of when you are, you know, have you, you know, you've ever looked at that little picture that looks both like a duck and like a rabbit? The old lady, young lady, yeah. That, the old lady, pictures, young yeah. lady. So when you look at them before you've become familiar with them, you, you look at one and you try really, really hard to see the duck but you can just see the rabbit and you know that there's something else to see, but you just can't see it until you, you know, create some sort of perspective. You spin it around, you do something different until, and then all of a sudden it clicks. You can then see the duck and the rabbit, and then you can't see anything but the duck and the yeah, rabbit. You can't unsee, you can't that. unsee yeah, that, exactly. right? So organizational paradox is the socially constructive version of that where, and this is very common in high hazard operations. So the literature out there is saying this stuff is happening all the time. This is when we get stuck. And I've used the example before that we encountered at Los Alamos, which is the bumper sticker that says, Work free safe zone. Remember when that yeah, came yeah, out? Yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and then and then Pete Nanos become became completely incensed at that. Um but that whole idea of people get stuck when you have competing demands in the organization and they can just see the rabbit of that demand and they can't see the duck. And then and then that creates all kinds of organizational turmoil and problems, and it keeps us from making good decisions for the organization. And, and that's why, I mean, you're exactly right. That's why we did cold-eyed reviews. That's why we, I mean, that, that par- that's really an interesting way to think about paradox as a limiting factor in the way we understand and manage high-hazard work. Yeah. What's and so and so because we can measure that little cognitive phenomenon, right? That yeah. particular cognitive phenomenon, then it's a nice way instead of you know everybody knows how hard it is to measure ROI on training or or, or absence, to measure performance in general when you're or, trying to measure safety performance or right? the absence of a null set. You can't measure something that doesn't happen, right? That's exactly. difficult. That's why leading data is impossible. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So that's. That's why the the organizational paradox part of it is so important. And the individual aspect of that whole dynamic is our own defensiveness to that situation. When you cannot see the duck, how do you feel? Oh, that's interesting. It's frustrating, right? And so I'm trying to measure that frustration when we can't see the duck. And the test, to be a part of your study... You don't have to be a genius. You don't have to be stupid. You just no. have to be you. So you're looking yeah. for all sorts of people in all yeah. sorts of places. You need people badly. I need I mean, people badly. And, and so, so this basically... Is, this may be, uh, yeah. at, the, at the risk of sounding, this is a desperate plea for help. You, If you don't get the people to do the test, you can't do the study. Right. So we need your help. I am trying to... This study is designed to create a... Uh, to establish... Um, not causation because it's not an experiment, um, but to establish predictive validity. So does emotional, can emotional intelligence and cognitive complexity predict how we're going to respond to organizational paradox? And in order to do that, I need 
quantitative data. And the fact is that there isn't. There aren't a lot of quantitative data, quantitative studies here. In fact, I couldn't really find any quantitative studies in this field. There are tons of case studies on organizational paradox yeah, yeah. within high hazard yeah. organizations, but I'm trying to find this specific relationship, which means that I need 200 people to take this test. And if you're an engineer, if you're a technical person, and you listen to this podcast and you know you're out there, this is your chance to be a quant. I mean, you can actually give quantitative data. So for God's sakes, don't miss this chance. Yes. Because you can put quantitative data around what is normally a really fluffy case study. Right. No, this takes, so this study is really the contribution is attempting to take this to uh, a little bit more rigorous level as far as our understanding of the relationships of all of these different psychological factors. So let's talk about this part, because this part I think is worth saying. It's not an it's not a non-substantial test. Yeah. It's and, and they're not hard though. I mean, no. Uh, just, I think they're fun, but they you are, know me, I'm uh, a geek. Well, they are. <laughs> but I actually would agree. So, so I should be honest with you guys and tell you that um, Martha sent me a link for this, and probably some of you probably got this link, and so I took it because you know that's that's what you do. And I started taking it on my phone in an airport where you know that's you got time to do stuff like that. It's very fun. But I didn't leave myself enough time. And so I will tell you, and, and you should speak this, Martha, it takes, uh, it takes a couple hours to do it. But if you do it on the same computer, so I switched, when I got home, I switched to my real computer because, um, well, you can see and you can type on it, right? Yeah. It's, and and it, I was able to come open it up and close it. So I didn't have to do it all at once on my real computer. Right. But it's, it's, it's very fun. Yeah. Because it asks you very interesting questions. And I think you answer in an interesting way. You, you get to sort of tell stories. Yeah. Which, that's, I, mean, how, I, which I think, and you yeah. should know, no, so spelling doesn't matter. <laughs> For God's sakes, formatting doesn't matter. You get a little text box, just write the story. I was worried about paragraph spacing, and, yeah. and then I realized, oh, you know, this, no. it's anonymous data. It's going to be dumped. It's going to be coded. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's dumped into a system. So just write the story. And I tried to write it as clever as I could. Right. I mean, I worked hard to make yeah. it clever. Yeah. But once I gave up on formatting and uh, and sort of worried about the, the grammatic correctness of it, uh -huh. then it became super easy to write. I mean, right. then I just told a story. And this and these are psychological tests that are, are getting to, of course, some of your unconscious processes. So they're kind of interesting, you know, yeah. and fun to do. Yeah. And and the best thing is not to think about it. You're you're supposed to be thoughtful about it. But, and which means you're supposed to really pay attention to how you feel and think and what your response is. What was that matching one, that thing where you... That's the cognitive complexity test. That was really fun, that one. That is really very cool. And, and, it's, and it's very interesting. And I mean, take your time with that, but don't overthink it. Like thinking about it isn't, there's no right or wrong answer. You're, you're, you're supposed to get to that gut instinct, but really think about, really try and tap, tap into your gut instinct when you do those. So that's funny you said that because I didn't feel any sense of urgency at all in that test. Okay. So you just kind of, you just, I mean, the answer just becomes really apparent. You're like, okay, it's this one. And yeah. you click it in and you're done. Yeah. Oh, that's good. And that one's kind of fun as well. And then the one where you tell stories is fun. Right. And don't be scared. Don't be scared of the story one. I'm I'm afraid when you look at it, you're well. It's it's a yeah. little, it's it's just tell the story. Just type the story in the box, and that one's actually whatever comes whatever yeah. comes to mind. This that is one's your actually really fun. To be, yeah, creative. And there's no wrong. I mean, there's it's no a story. wrong. It's just the story that comes to mind when you when you look at a picture, and then the the and then not the last one, but you know everything comes up in different order. But the um the you go out to right. mhs.com um, to do the Mesquite test, which is the Mayer Solovi Caruso emotional intelligence test, which is a really well established psychological test of emotional intelligence. And that one's fun too, because it's giving you situations and it's asking you how you would respond in right. a different situation. And you don't, you, so you don't really have to go, the, the, the your webpage takes you there. Yeah. Like I didn't have to go anywhere to no. take that test. I, I now realize, in fact, until you said you go out, I didn't know. Oh, you didn't realize No, that I didn't out. know that was a different place. But, yeah. but that's, the, that's the third test. And that's all there are, right? Just the three. Yeah. And, and they come up in random order. So they're in no, like the order we talked about them is not the order I took them in. 
Um, and yeah. since I did it twice because I changed instruments, it, it was not the same. So the order doesn't matter, yeah. but they're pretty easy. And I would say, I would say schedule, this is me talking, Martha, and then you can answer. I would say schedule, give yourself an hour, but it's probably going to take two. But you can, you can come <laughs> right. back to it right. and, and understand why you're doing it, that what you're doing is helping collect this data on really how, how, how people emotionally respond, which then colors how organizations respond. Right. So I, I think the payoff on it is really high. So it's definitely yeah. worth doing. Based on the literature, my first estimate was two hours, and then I, you know, was looking at how long it was taking people, and my estimate went down to about an hour. So it is somewhere between an hour and two hours. I think that if you sit down for 30 minutes in three different times on the same device, which is what you're saying, yeah, yeah. if you're on the same device, then SurveyMonkey puts a cookie there, and you're able to go back. And, and you know, my IRB, <laughs> because this is anonymous, it's the cookies will, you can cl- clear your cache, right? But I also will clear everything out of SurveyMonkey. So n- I, SurveyMonkey nor I will have yeah. your IP addresses. But the crazy thing is that the data you collect isn't – I mean, it's anonymous, so that's important. It's right. also not really personal, and it's, it doesn't no. – Like, there's no question that says, when did you stop beating your wife? I mean, <laughs> no, it's, really, like it's really like, look at this picture and tell a story of what you think is happening. Um, look at this and compare it with that. Which one do you think meets that one? Yeah. I mean, it's 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 a you've taken these tests before. In fact, um, you're really good with these tests, and I think you're right, Martha. I think so. I don't think one test was longer than the other. Right? They're all they're, about thirty they're, they're minutes. Are, there are three of them, and I think they're that's what you have to be aware of. And they probably do take about you're probably right, probably a half hour each. Yeah. And, and but they're really worth it, and we need your help. We need your data. I mean, Martha yeah. needs it in order to successfully do this study. And so we, we're really appealing to you to, to get on board and get it. How do they get there? Oh, so you just go to martika.com forward slash research, which is M-A-R-T-I-C-A dot C-O-M forward slash research. Martika.com forward slash research. I'll put that in the show notes. I don't think anybody reads the show notes. Yeah. This is really the one chance we get for them to go to it, but it's easy. It's just martika.com slash forward slash research. Right. And then once you get on there, um, first of all, huge thank you from me. And I know a huge thank you from Martha as well. Secondly, just, just go through the process. It's, it's easy. And the data we're collecting, I think, is really pretty important, pretty yeah. meaningful. And I am, um, and the IRB has allowed me to, to do um, what we call snowball research. Right, snowball sampling, sorry. So let your friends know. Let every, oh, you know, people who don't listen to the podcast, you know, let them know. Share it with your colleagues. Um, you know, I mean, it could be a fun thing to talk about <laughs> around the water sure. cooler. But it's it's really important that I have enough people for you know, statistical significance so that we can really establish whether there is a link between these cognitive, emotional um, abilities, capabilities, and something that's really important to our, 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 our organizations being safe. Make me one more promise. Will you? Okay. When you're done with the research, come back and talk about it. Oh, I will. I'm dying to hear that. Thank you. Thank you, Martika. (laughs) <laughs> M-A-R-T-I-C-A dot com forward slice research. You guys, please, please take a chance to do this. Martha, it's always worth its weight in gold just to spend time with you. So thank you. Come over anytime. You're the best. <laughs> so there you have it. That's the podcast. Martika dot com forward slash research. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's right. Um, it, Listen to it. I mean, do it. It takes a while, but it's worth it. I did it. If I can get through it, you can get through it. I promise. It's it was not, it's not hard. Actually, it's not hard. It's kind of fun. It's one of those fun things that you can do. So that is the podcast for today. Uh, hang around because we have lots more to talk about. Big stories. I've got another great story to tell you. I'm, I'm not even teasing these to get you to stay on. Just stay on. I know it's a privilege to have you listen. I'm glad you do. Thanks for being a part of this. We're building community, you guys. One podcast at a time. It's just me and you. 
Until then, learn something new every single day. Have as much fun as you possibly can. And for goodness sakes, you guys, be safe. <laughs>